So as a third year cardiology fellow, I've had at least two years of nuclear cardiology experience and exposure. And I always wished that when I started cardiology that there was an intro video to just show me the basics of how to interpret and look at nuclear cardiology imaging in a systematic way. So that's what I'm doing for my first year cardiology fellows. And hopefully if anyone else out there is starting cardiology or just wants to get a little bit more information about what a nuclear cardiology stress imaging looks like, this is the video for you. This video might be a little bit too in-depth for people earlier in their medical training, but I think if you understand the basics of it, you can better serve your patients and hopefully make cardiology a little bit less daunting. And hopefully for patients, you can kind of see what a doctor thinks, specifically what cardiologists are looking for when you have a nuclear stress test. We're going to review nuclear physics, which unfortunately is as bad as it sounds. Resources that I use and that I recommend to better understand nuclear imaging because this video is not all inclusive. Just like every other aspect of cardiology, you're gonna have to do some reading on your own, but I hope that this video will give you a good foundation so that when you go reference those other materials that you'll have a good starting point. We'll also review some common mistakes that you can make clinically and some overriding philosophies. But the number one thing that I think you need to understand is that there's a reason that cardiology fellowships are three years long. Just like when you probably started reading EKGs, it isn't intuitive at first, but the more you do it and the more reps you get, the better you'll be at it. And just like doing push-ups, you can read about it all you want, but at the end of the day, the more nuclear cardiology images that you read, the better you'll get at it. And after we review some of the basics, I'll go over a few common cases that I've seen over my short career and hopefully give you a few guiding tips when you encounter those specific instances. Additionally, we'll review some basics of EKG and echo stress tests and what you need to know walking into a stress test. Now I realized as I was making this video that if I want to cover EKG and echo stress test as well as everything I just detailed that this video would end up being really long. So instead I broke it up into a few parts. I'll put it into one playlist so you can understand stress test more completely. <laughs> So let's start out by reviewing the basics of stress testing. Stress tests are ideal for intermediate risk patients, maybe even a history of coronary artery disease, patients who you have a high clinical suspicion who have coronary artery disease. You don't want to be doing a stress test. You wanna be jumping to the gold standard test, which is a left heart catheterization. The reason for that is what do you do with the information if it's negative? You really suspect that someone has coronary artery disease, you're performing a stress test to do that and it comes up negative? Are you really gonna send that patient along without performing further tests? You wanna skip that and go right to a left heart catheterization. Similarly, in an extremely low risk patient, for instance, a very young patient, no risk factors, not really classic symptoms. You don't really want to be doing a stress test because in that patient, if it ends up being a false positive, what are you going to do with that information? You can certainly do another type of stress test where maybe you start off with an EKG stress and you do an echo stress maybe a nuclear imaging test, but you certainly don't want to subject that patient to a left heart catheterization. All in all, you have to understand what you're going to do with that information after you get it. This is really the theory of Bayes' theorem. When you have a patient with baseline characteristics, a positive or negative test is going to increase or decrease the suspicion or likelihood that they do or don't have whatever it is you're testing for. Most commonly, we test for coronary artery disease or flow limiting blockages in the arteries of the heart. A patient with a 50% pretest probability with a positive test can bump up to a very high likelihood that they have some type of issue that you need to do a further intervention on. Similarly, a negative test can bring them down or their risk of having that issue much lower. Sometimes the patient's test is not frankly positive and maybe it's not frankly negative and it's somewhere in between. Sometimes we do in fact do another type of imaging modality that wasn't used initially. Again, sometimes that's why I initially will couple an EKG stress with an echo stress because it increases the sensitivity and specificity of that test. Or sometimes we'll realize, you know, an EKG echo stress isn't ideal for this patient. Maybe they already have baseline regional wall motion, whatever the reason may be. Then we'll switch from that EKG echo stress to a nuclear imaging stress test. Or sometimes we'll go straight to a cath. And it's also okay to jump right to a left heart catheterization. As some of our interventionalist attendings say, the answer sometimes is at the tip of the catheter. So let's say it's your first day in the exercise stress lab. What do you want to do? First thing that I encourage everyone and our attendings really do as well is to be in the room when the stress testing is being performed. First off, it really lets you see what happens during a stress test. You know, a lot of us as physicians in internal medicine would order these, but I couldn't tell you definitively what the process was step by step. And this gives you greater ability to understand what your patients are going to be going through and being able to better detail 
what they should expect on the day of their stress test. Now the nurses and techs are great at detailing what happened during the stress test because you might not be able to be at every stress test and we get that information in the packet, but being able to really be there and see it with your own eyes and talk to the patient while they're having this stress test adds a lot of clinical utility and information that you otherwise can't glean from paperwork. Now let's take a look at someone actually doing an exercise stress test. This subject is starting off at 10% incline at 1.7 miles per hour. It seems pretty easy because for an average young man who's otherwise healthy, it is. And just for reference, an average commercial treadmill, I think can only go up to like 10 or 12% grade. So it's like you're actually walking up a steep hill, not just walking on a treadmill. Every three minutes, we increase both the incline and the speed of the treadmill. After the first three minutes, we go up to 12% and two and a half miles an hour. It then goes to 14% and 3.4 miles per hour, then 16% grade and 4.2 miles an hour. And where I had to quit was after I did three minutes at 18% grade at five miles an hour. So now you know what we're doing when we exercise, but what if the patient can't exercise? Sometimes it's just logistical reasons. Maybe they broke their ankle. Maybe they have an amputation. Maybe they have severe back pain that limits their ability to exercise. In those instances, we can use pharmacological agents like regadenosine that cause vasodilation to simulate exercise and increase coronary blood flow. We can also use another medication called dobutamine, which artificially will increase the heart rate and cardiac output. I'm not gonna get into the great details about dobutamine and regadenosine stress test, but the important concepts for medical trainees to understand is that you have to choose a modality that stresses the patient physiologically, and then an imaging modality that is appropriate for that patient, be it an EKG, echo, or nuclear imaging test. Now, what happens if you have a negative stress test? Typically, when I'm discussing this with patients, I don't like to say, you're good, you don't have any blockages in your arteries, good to go. I try to explain to them that they're unlikely to have a critical heart attack within the following year. However, we're all human, and part of being human is that we all have some degree of narrowing of the arteries, including the arteries of the heart. Atherosclerosis is the normal process of narrowing of the arteries. Thus, I try to go into detail about some modifiable risk factors to help decrease their future risk of heart attack. Things like avoiding smoking, controlling comorbidities that increase their risk of heart disease like diabetes or hypertension if they have them, and of course, exercising regularly and having a healthy diet. No test is perfect. Every test has its own sensitivity and specificity, and we're using these non-invasive tests that are surrogate markers for the gold standard of a left heart catheterization, because we don't want to jump to a potentially invasive procedure, although very safe, it still carries some risk. However, sometimes the test isn't conclusive. It's somewhere in the middle. And that's why I always explain to patients that sometimes additional testing might be warranted. We might want to confirm our suspicion that it might be a true negative test, whereas other times the next step, if it's positive, might be a left heart catheterization. Now, what does it mean for a stress test to be positive? How do we actually diagnose it when you're standing there with the EKG running with the patient in the room? Now, classically, greater than one millimeter ST depression after the J point of the QRS complex is a positive stress test. Similarly, if you see two millimeters or greater of ST depression 60 milliseconds after the J point, that's gonna increase the likelihood that it's not a false positive and that it's a true positive. And that makes sense. If you increase the, or decrease the threshold of any test, you're gonna change the sensitivity or specificity of it. One more important distinction I wanna make about ST depressions in exercise stress tests is that you cannot localize it to a specific area. This is not like an ST elevation during a myocardial infarction or heart attack. When you have ST depressions during a stress test, it is non-specific to a specific location. So if you have ST depressions and inferior leads, that does not mean that you have ischemia in the inferior aspect of the heart. But there's a lot of information that we look at, not just the ST depressions. So what's the other information that we wanna look at? We wanna look at their heart rate, what they're able to achieve, how their heart rate recovers, their blood pressure response to exercise, as well as the EKG or echo changes that we might observe. Throughout the test, we're taking the patient's SpO2 or oxygenation, checking their blood pressure regularly, checking their EKG, as well as looking at their heart rate throughout this. We want patients to achieve 85% of their maximum tolerated heart rate. That's a simple formula where we take 220, subtract their age, and then multiply it by 85%. 220 minus age is their maximum tolerated heart rate, and then getting 85% of that. Now, an important distinction to remember is that the only true way to measure someone's maximum tolerated heart rate 
is to get a CO2 mask, measure how much carbon dioxide they're breathing out, getting regular blood work and measuring their SVO2, but we don't do that. So this equation is just a rough man's estimate. It might be a little bit off, but that's the target heart rate that we want to achieve. Now, if we hit 85%, we don't just stop the test because we want to see how far can they go, what's their exercise tolerance, and how they're doing physiologically. Typically, if a patient can get to 10 metabolic equivalents, it's generally a very good prognostic sign. And if a patient isn't able to achieve that, it's a little bit of a poor prognostic sign. We also wanna see their heart rate recover appropriately. It's abnormal for their heart rate to stay sustained at a very high heart rate despite being in recovery. You also wanna look at their blood pressure response. It is highly abnormal and very dangerous negative prognostic sign if their blood pressure drops with exercise. It's normal for your body to clamp down on their vessels, send blood to the appropriate muscles that are exercising, and your blood pressure should go up appropriately. Similarly, you wanna note what their blood pressure was when they started and what their maximum blood pressure was. If someone starts out at 120 over 80 and then goes up to 240 over 100 and they start getting symptoms at that stage or that time when their blood pressure is very high, it might be related to their blood pressure. Now for the younger medical trainees earlier in their careers, there's five different things that you need to look at on EKGs that preclude using an EKG stress test in isolation without an additional imaging modality like an echo or nuclear imaging. If you understand it, you won't have to memorize it and you might not get flustered on the test day because these are certainly testable material. Keyword high yield. These are things that change the EKG at baseline to make ST depressions extremely difficult or baseline uninterpretable. Things like a left bundle branch block. Think about when you try to diagnose a myocardial infarction or a STEMI or ST elevations in someone who has a left bundle. We have a whole other criteria that allows us to help diagnose this. And for a stress test, it makes it almost uninterpretable. Think about something else that can cause a left bundle, a ventricular paced rhythm. So in patients with a left bundle, or a V-paced rhythm, you don't want to perform just an EKG stress test. You want to add on some other type of imaging modality. I've talked a lot about ST depressions because that's how we diagnose ischemia in these patients. So anyone who has baseline ST depressions, it'll make doing an EKG stress test extremely difficult and uninterpretable. So if someone has baseline ST depressions, you don't want to do in isolation an EKG stress, you want to add on another imaging modality. Similarly, there's another medication that can cause baseline ST depressions in a slurring manner. That medication is digoxin. So if you see a dig effect on their EKG, which is that downsloping slurring of the ST segment, you don't want to do just an exercise EKG stress, you want to add on another imaging modality. And if you want to know more about the history of digoxin, I've made a YouTube video about that. You can check it out in one of these other videos. And one other is LVH or left ventricular hypertrophy pattern with strain. Specifically, when you have a very thick heart and you see that on EKG by very tall QRS complexes, it often is accompanied by a strain pattern where the ST segments might be a little bit depressed with two A inversions, which can be normal in patients with LVH strain pattern. But again, with baseline ST depressions, it makes it very hard to interpret ST depressions on an EKG exercise stress. And lastly, Wolf Parkinson White or pre-excitation pattern is another thing that you might want to add on another imaging modality. Now this brings me to another caveat in that exercise EKG stress tests are not only used to diagnose coronary artery disease. Sometimes in patients with a pre-excitation pattern like WPW or Wolf Parkinson White will use an EKG stress to risk stratify them. In WPW, you have a short PR interval and a delta wave indicating that that bypass tract in the heart is getting activated. When we perform an exercise stress test in patients with WPW, we want to risk stratify this rhythm. When a patient's heart rate increases, we want to see that that delta wave goes away. That tells us that when the heart rate is going much faster, it is going down its intrinsic rhythm and not this other accessory pathway. If it does not disappear, then it might tell us that it's a slightly higher risk pathway and the management might be a little bit different. Other reasons that we can perform an exercise EKG stress is to monitor the effectiveness or the dosage of a drug. Specifically, flecainide is one of the drugs that has a rate dependent effect, meaning that the faster the heart rate, the more effective the medication is. One of the side effects that you can see on EKG with an increased heart rate is that the QRS complex will widen while someone is on flecainide. So sometimes we'll perform this EKG stress test while they're on their flecainide and we'll evaluate, does the QRS complex widen? If it doesn't, then we can properly keep that patient on that dose. However, if the QRS complex widens out, we might wanna decrease that dose. Along with EKG abnormalities, there are a few clinical criteria 
that are absolute and relative contraindications to performing exercise stress tests. Some of them are a little bit obvious and some of them you might not think about. Some of them are severe electrolyte abnormalities. I'm not gonna be telling someone to run on a treadmill if their potassium's one. So severe electrolyte abnormalities need to be fixed before we do any type of stress testing. They need to be stable. If a patient has severe uncontrolled hypertension, if they walk into the clinic and we're doing a stress test and their blood pressure is 180 over 100, their blood pressure is gonna go uncontrollably high and it can be very dangerous. We don't wanna be performing stress tests on patients with uncontrolled high blood pressure. Similarly, we don't want to perform stress tests on patients with uncontrolled tachyarrhythmias. If a patient has atrial fibrillation, but it's under control, then we can certainly still perform a stress test. But if they have a newly diagnosed AFib and they're in a rapid ventricular rate, we do not wanna be performing the stress test on them. It would be dangerous to put them in that type of setting. Two other diagnoses where you have to think about it a little bit before you perform and jump to an exercise stress test is with aortic stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, specifically if they have a left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. These are not absolute contraindications and we actually do perform stress test on these individuals for a variety of different reasons. Sometimes in aortic stenosis, it helps us evaluate objectively what type of exercise tolerance the patient may have. In aortic stenosis, as the severity of the valvular stenosis gets worse, patients often just decrease what they can do. In aortic stenosis, the valve gets more and more narrow. It's kind of like putting your thumb over a garden hose, and that causes weakness in the heart over time. Sometimes patients have told me that they don't have any limitations. They just don't go up their stairs anymore. They move their bedroom to the the first floor. Although they might not be getting symptoms, we can't objectively know are they truly having symptoms because they're not pushing themselves. Similarly, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with an obstruction, it might not be present at rest. But if you exercise them, we might be able to put an echo probe on their chest and look for gradients inside the heart to better treat them. In these patients, we'll specifically use a recumbent bike in order to have them bike against a resistance and have their heart rate go up appropriately. In this setting, they can lay down we can have an echo probe on them while they're exercising because it's quite challenging to have someone run on a treadmill, lay down, get an echo, and then have them jump back on the treadmill. That's just Looney Tunes. In fact, I actually did the recumbent chair and it's also quite challenging, but as you can see, it makes it a lot easier to be able to have a sonographer next to the patient getting good windows and looking at the heart so we can see the pressure gradients inside the heart while they're exercising to evaluate do we need to increase or change some of their medications or perform possible procedures in the future. My last major point is that similar to how patients need to have a relatively clean EKG in order to make those tests interpretable, you need to be able to get good images on your echo. This might be more difficult in patients with severe COPD where the lungs obstruct the view of the heart or in patients who are severely obese where it simply is more difficult for the ultrasound beams to make it to the heart. Thankfully, we can also use an ultrasound enhancement agent that allows us to really view the heart a little bit better. Colloquially, we'll use the word as a contrast agent. It is not the same type of contrast that we use in CT scans. So patients are often very wary of having this agent, but you can tell them that it is not the same type of contrast that's iodinated and that can cause contrast-induced nephropathy. These are lipid coated echo micro bubbles that allow us to really lighten and brighten up the inside of the ventricle to see the ventricle better and let us evaluate for any regional wall motion. And it really helps us view the heart and diagnose any regional wall motion abnormalities a whole lot better. Now, I know I went into a lot of detail about exercise stress testing, but one of the take home points that you should always know is that if a patient can exercise, they should. In the next video, I'll go into nuclear imaging and all the other things that I detailed in the beginning, including some of my favorite resources. A sneak peek, my favorite one is Brunwald. I know I feel like an old timey doc because some of my internal medicine attendings would say, read Harrison's and I would roll my eyes because the book was like twice as thick as this. But this book really is amazing and it has a great few chapters on stress testing. And if you need a primary resource, you can't go wrong with Brownwald. So subscribe so you don't miss out on my next video. I hope this helped.